Hi, everyone. This is Sima, the inclusionist with Everyday Conversations on Race for Everyday People, where we bring people together across race to have conversations about race. If you've ever wanted to have a conversation about race, but you are afraid to do so because you're afraid of either A, saying the wrong thing, or you are afraid of being ignored or trivialized, then this podcast is for you. If you like what you hear today, please go to raceconvo, convo like conversation.com and download more episodes. And please share the show with at least one or two other people. And if you'd like to help us continue to have these excellent programs and help sustain us, please go to Race Convo and make a tax deductible donation. And if you'd like to bring me to your organization because you like what you hear today and you'd like to have me come in and facilitate a dialogue or help you create a more inclusive work environment, then hit me up, Sima at SimaLieberman.com. So I'm really excited today about my guests. And because one of them is a good friend of mine, Wanda Whitaker. In a minute, I want to have all of them introduce themselves to you. So I have three guests. I'm lucky enough to have three guests today. And we're going to be talking about the Modern Elder Academy. Now, I don't know how many of you are elders, but if you're not an elder now, hopefully you can become one because the alternative is not good. So I'm going to have you each introduce yourself. And I'll start with Diane, because like you're right in front of, in terms of my line of sight. Tell us in a couple of sentences who you are. So thank you, Sima, for um, having us on your um, podcast. I'm Dr. Diane Johnson, and I am CEO and founder of Mapu Consulting. Mapu is a Kosa name that means woman who carries ideas. And that was a name that was uh, bequeathed me from some elders in Durban, South Africa, when I was honored enough to do a, a co-lead a culture brigade in South Africa in the in the 90s. I don't say when in the 90s, but anyway. And um, so my work is really about the intersection of systems change, organizational culture, um, social sector, and uh, conscious capital, right? And and being a facilitator and a change maker around uh, organiza individual organizational culture, as well as community and uh, community transformation. And that's oh, I me. love that. Thank you so much. All right, now I'm gonna go to Cassius. Cassius Johnson, tell us about Good you. Johnson, yes. Good to meet you, so delighted to be here. Um, I'm from Alabama, grew up there. Uh, and went to school in Texas where I was trained to be a policy person. I've been chief of staff for a member of the Texas House Representative, and I've worked in philanthropy and worked in strategy and operation for a lot of large, several large social impact organizations. And I run do consulting work around that now. But um, just looking forward to having a conversation with you about how, like, having done all that work through these years, how... I arrived at life and come to look for a place like the Modern Elder Academy to just help sharpen myself and even explore a little bit about what elder means. I mean, it's a little bit more nuanced than what the uh, vernacular may assume. So let's look forward to that. That's me. You know, that's actually a good topic because I'm part of a diversity group called um, Diversity, diversity 2020. Mm -hmm. And no, it was Diversity 2000, but then we realized that, you know, the whole world wasn't great in 2000, so we had to keep on going. And a couple of people have said to me, yes, Simonel, so you're one of the elders. And I'm like, mm, well, I don't know. And then somebody said, oh, well, they, they said, well, you're an OG. I said, I'll take it. So It's a compliment now. It's a compliment. It is. Yeah. Yeah. As long as I'm not, you know, one of the, um, well, going to put her out to pasture now. So Wanda. Wanda Hello. Whitaker. Hi, Simma. It's not so nice to be on your show. And um, I'm originally from Washington, D.C. and moved to San Francisco when I was 29 because I wanted to take a risk and, and see how I could live out my life without uh, being around my family. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what we do. We move from the east to the west. From the west to the east. <laughs> And um, yeah, and from the West Indies. And um, so that's when I 
decided that um, maybe I wanted to pursue being an artist. It was the first time, uh, even though I had uh, graduated from the University of Maryland and took art as a uh, minor, I never painted before. And it, it's only when I got to California that I said, well, maybe let me let me look at a uh, painting as a or art as a as a job. Right. And um, so I did that. I started painting once I came here and I still had started another organization. I had a, a marketing consultancy agency, too, at the time that I ran for like 30 years. But in the background, I was always doing art. And so it came a time when I reached a certain age. I said, you know what? What is my purpose? What is my real purpose for being here? And then I said, you know, my real purpose for being here is I want to help others to heal themselves. So I changed my vocation and became a hypnotherapist. And <laughs> I still do art. Um, and, uh, and my purpose is to empower and to inspire, awaken others to their higher selves and greatest potential. And I do that through the arts and sciences. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Well, people who are listening, you can tell this is like a very interest. this is a really interesting group. And every time I talk to, with Wanda, I find out something else that she's done. I came here when I was 29 too, but I never painted, maybe by numbers. And even then I couldn't stay in the lines. So, all right, let's talk about first, what is the Modern Elder Academy? And then we're going to talk about the Black Modern Elder Academy. So, so Modern Elder Academy was the conception of Chip Connolly and Christine's um, 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 sober, so, 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 sober um, who really kind of come to realize that way we conceptualize midlife was really off. In the 1950s, the group talked about it as a crisis. And he really came oh, up with yeah. a really more beautiful analogy for what we, was actually happening at that life and recognized that really that establishment of that principle that was a disservice to kind of human development, right? That we had at other points in our life and transitions had supports, we've had rituals, and then at midlife, we have none of that. And instead of thinking of midlife as a crisis, he looked at the, the analogy of the life cycle of a butterfly in that in, in that, that period of chrysalis, right? A midlife, instead of a crisis, it's a chrysalis. And Laos, in, in, instead of kind of thinking about that as a period in which, you know, for a crisis, recognize the butterfly, you're you come, you come out as a larvae, you become a caterpillar, you consume information, social capital, financial capital, status. And at some point between the ages 35, 65, you just, you have this aha moment and at, start asking these core questions about why. As Diane said, and wanted to talk about purpose, what is your purpose? Why, why if, if you buy into, especially in the Western conceptualization of things, things like meritocracy and hard work pays off. You know, you come to this moment, we've all been there. I mean, I'm 45 and I got there, but it can happen sooner or than, uh, 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 later. So instead of th thinking about that as a crisis, as a chrysalis, and it becomes very important what you do in that chrysalis, the intentionality about making sense of what you've learned from your lived experience, the things that give you joy, that give you purpose, the things that you can do with routine, and, 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 and routinize to create space in your life to do things that give you joy. Art as one that was articulating, for example, and really tapped into as Julia Cameron talks about your, your uh, art, the artist's way, you know, like that really deep space that you have to create and protect for your creativity. Like, and then also kind of sort out on the other end, what no longer serves you, mindsets, dispositions, routines, vocabulary, people, and where you need to create and, and look and redefine the boundaries that you have established in your life in order to, as Julian uh, Cameron talk about, to rid yourself of the crazy makers, right? So, you know, and, and so that's a lot of what happens at the Modern Outdoor Academy is like you have this space that we often don't get 
in midlife period, but particularly in midlife, where you can detach from your everyday routines and ask in some deep questions with some, with some shared space that people are at the same point in their lives. And that's sacred. And we owe ourselves that kind of opportunity to experience that ritual that happens at the Modern Elder Academy. It's something that I think is particularly helpful to folks of color, black and brown folks, and our experience in um, uh, living in America and our the, the experience of our ancestors that we carried really in our DNA and how do we uh, really make sense of that. And so I found Modern Elder Academy as a part of defining myself after a trip to Ghana and South Carolina and tracing my roots. And so it was here I was able to find community with people of color at the Modern Elder Academy, which the Black, Auto, Black Modern Elder Academy we're here to talk about today is really about creating this space, particularly for Black folks, to really do that midlife chrysalis stuff so that you can emerge as a modern elder, right? And so that's what the Modern Elder Academy is about. Chip's got a new book called Learning Love to Love Midlife that he's just released. That's really a good um, framework, 12 ways that you can kind of think about this. Uh, and he has a number of other books, The Year of Wisdom that I also have right here that really tracks his um, uh, kind of concepts and thinking through a year post in his blogs and such. So a lot of literature out there. And yeah, so that's that's the Modern Elder Academy and it's exciting space and play is sacred. I think the thing that is also so, um, and I use this word purposefully, profound about MEA is that it was uh, constructed with the intention of being a wisdom school. That the, that the, the, that the idea of reframing culturally what we um know and how we think about what it is to be an elder and 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 one of the things that i think is so stunning about chip is that he's one of the most um he's like a, I, I consider him a public intellectual like that that he is that that his absorption of so many concepts and then reframing and when and when you look at the array of faculty who come in to mea so it, it and and that now there are the pillars. What is it? Transition, purpose, transition, and what's the third one? Purpose, transition, and wisdom. And wisdom, right, right, right. So that there is a there's a way that that um, MEA both in their campus in Baja, Mexico, and their campus that it's just about to open um, in New Mexico is really about like cre creating the space for the for uh, for individuals who participate not just in the five days that they go there but that 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 being there for five days creates a community and that you are part of a global community of folks who are um consistently in search of and redefining who they are in the life phases that they are in right and one of the reasons why we created how we knew it was very very important to create a black modern elder academy is that for people of African descent, for people who identify as African Americans, or um, is that our lived experience um, is 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 culturally and is very is culturally specific, and so even how we as um, people of African descent, African Americans, that we we experience the world in a particular in a in a particular way, both systematically and and community wise and personally. And so how it was important to to um expand both both expand and also be specific around what are the concepts uh, around modern elder academy? How are they specific and unique to to black folks, right? And creating the space for a, a community that doesn't have to code switch that can share the full array and diversity of experience as black people and the, the, the various stages of eldering. Right. And that's, I think one of the reasons we, there were, there were a, a number of us who said, this is amazing. And it would even be um, in the same way that they're doing MEAs for women, they're doing MEAs for LGBTQI. You know, we, we recognize that there is something that's really powerful about MEA in general, but then when we can um, focus 
um, around MEA for a particular lived experiences, particular lived experiences and social identities. Well, that sounds that sounds amazing to me. I, two things came to mind. One is like midlife is different at different ages because, you know, for me, I felt old at 45 and I'm mm -hmm. thinking I wasn't old at 45. You know, I was young, you know, and a lot of times, like I would think I was too old to do something. I look at my life now and I and I look back, actually, and I think, you know, why didn't I try that? What was I afraid of? And I'm just hoping that the rest of my life I can get past that. And actually, you know, purpose right now, I think that I'm meant to do this podcast. I mean, I really do. I feel like that, that that's what God mm. want, you know, wants me to do this podcast and a lot of other things that I haven't done yet. But so the thing that the curriculum really focuses on is mindsets, right? And really draws from the great work of Carol Dweck at Penn and other uh, researchers that really requires you at this, this is a perfect moment in in life, in midlife, to really interrogate the mindsets that you have routinized and become accustomed mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. And really, like, Seema, in your situation, like, just write them down. Like, just be honest about them and just enumerate them in ways that you can start to ask the question, which ones serve you, which ones with kind of subtle adjustment, adjustments to them might celebrate new adventures in your life. Like, that's I think about like travel, like I have a good friend who has a really, at her age of 65, her phobia is around travel, but breaking through that travel phobia and that mindset around that has opened her mind to so many experiences of music and art and culture, by just, just really working in with intentionality and tools and strategies and approach on that one thing around travel. She changed her whole life experience. Well, I travel will. And I, I, you know, I, I, oh, I have to say, I make lists all the time. And without the list, I would just probably just sitting, sitting in my house thinking I got to make a list. So, <laughs> but, you know, back to the Black Elder Academy. One thing that also strikes me is that the way you said that is that let's expand this so that, you know, it could relate to a lot of to, to people with a Black experience instead of because you could have taken it another way i mean you could have gone you know what mm -mm. you know we're not included here this doesn't relate to us blah 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 and we're going to shut it down oh whatever I, don't, I did a show on cancel culture with with joel with joel and my friend Rusham. and um but it, it just also is an example of okay let, what can we do about this how do we how do we create something that's going to work for us so could you give some examples of what, you know, when you think about having a black elder, kind of, give, give me some examples of what you think about. Actually, I want to actually talk about um, the, the experience about how black MEA got created. The reason it got created was that there were, there were um, an array of black alumni. Wanda was, is, was one of the first ones, right? That there was a, there was, um, so that, so that there were, a, it, and that one of the things that's powerful about MEA is that it is a community. It is a community. I, I forget how many caches, how many countries and how many people, Wow. like, I don't know how many thousands of people have gone through MEA in, since its inception, which is, I think five, Wanda, was it five years ago? Oh, five years ago. Yeah. Five years ago. Right. So you have a community and, and I think it also had to do with timing because like so many communities after um, the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Black Lives Matter, there were like organizations that were monocultural or, or had challenges around being a diverse committee, looked at themselves and went, oh my gosh, like we've got to do something, right? So that, that helped um, catalyze the recognition of how, how powerful MEA is and how powerful it could be for a whole array of different folks, right? And so I think that it, it's that there were that, that recognition of like, oh, how powerful it could be for the, uh, the, the phenomenal array of, of black folks, professionals, artists, teachers, um, I love, you know, artivists, 
activists, you know, trainers, coaches, like how did they, not only would their individual lives be um, impacted, but that there would be a ripple effect around how do we reconceptualize what is what is eldering right? i mean because because they could they because they could have gotten real defensive and said oh no you know what this is how yeah. it is mm -hmm. so it just shows like a mindset well an inclusive mindset in order for us to be inclusive then this is what we need to do mm -hmm. well, well not only that i want to tell a short story about how the black martin elder week came about and I recall uh, going to Mexico, Baja, and, and Chip picked me up from the airport. And he talked about how he wanted to increase the number of, of Black people and people from the diaspora into um, the Martin Elder Academy. So he had intention to do mm -hmm. this. And um, he said, you know, I want to I wanted do something about it. I don't know what can be done yet but I'd like to see the numbers raised to about 35%. And that's how it started. So it starts out first with the person who's in charge of everything, right? The person at the top has to make some type of decision and be willing to just go out and do that without judgment, without criticism, without whatever. But he had such a high intention on doing that um, that he it opened it up to ideas. And those ideas started crystallizing as many of us began to speak and said, well, you know, maybe we should have a, um, one week dedicated to people from the African diaspora. Now that may not have uh, went well with faculty, we don't know. But because of him making that decision, everybody else fell into place. Right, and that's how this whole thing came about. And then uh, there were many, there were about five of us at the time who had already experienced MEA, not from a black perspective, but from a Martin Elder Academy perspective overall. And we came together as what we call the five sisters <laughs> to put this first Martin, black Martin Elder Academy week together. And I also wanted, um, uh, also I wanted talk about Paula Pretlow and Linda Grubbs who were, and Linda Parker Pennington who were part of the first five sisters. I wanna recognize them and acknowledge them as well, even though they're not here. Um, I do want to thank them for all of what they're doing and their work and putting this together as well. Yeah. And they I can come on the next one. Yeah. So I think um, also one of the things that is again so, um, unique and extraordinary about um, Black MEA is that there, there is something, so for instance, both both Wanda and my backgrounds are pictures from the Baja campus, right? So there's something about that the setting of, and, and Cash just talked about this, that, the, that, that, five, that five days of coming in and um, submerging yourself in an environment that is aesthetically beautiful, that is connected to nature, that has like a, a level of nurturance and support that then that 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 um, facilitates any participant. And this happens in the in the MEA in general and all the different workshops, as well as those that have a particular um, a particular objective in working with uh, a, a certain lived experience. But the, the space of self-care, nurturance, um, reflection, uh, that is very, very special. It's like, it's a gift that we give ourselves that allows us to reflect and engage in personal affirmation, personal transformation and community. So again and again, participants in MEA, and, and, and this was especially true for black MEA, that they felt their, that they felt that their lives had been transformed. The, 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 the initial cohort that met in October of 2022, it's still, because all the cohorts have the opportunity to have monthly check-ins. 
we are still meeting 18 months later, every month, because of the, the, the power of that experience and the power of envisioning what our lives look like in being or and becoming um, um, modern black modern elders, right? So there's, I mean, I think for me as someone like I'm, a, I'm a systems like my um, work is about transforming systems and structures, whether they be you know institutions and universities and colleges, whether they be you know government agencies of five, ten, twelve thousand people, whether they be social sector you know, or, or businesses are fueled by um, values, that the, the ability to, to look at what's happening at the system level, what's happening in our community, what's happening in our workplaces, what's happening in our, in our families, and then what's happening in ourselves. And what is so powerful about um, Black MEA is that it allows all of those levels to be explored. And to, and to think about and what will craft, what will assist us in crafting what we want our lives to be as we go into the second half, two, second half, third, what, like whatever fraction we're talking about, right? That actually, you know, that, that sounds so, that sounds so amazing to me when you talk about systems, it, you know, it makes me think about like organizations and also what's going on in the outside world. Now that if you have, like, say, Fearless Fund, you know, they they were, um, what was it? They they had, a, they were giving away a scholarship and was it to black women? And so then you had all these white people freaking out instead of seeing that this is going to benefit everybody, you know, that if you have something for, for black people, people of color, whatever it is, and you're going to make them like shine even more, doesn't that help? all of society doesn't that help oh. the country but instead it's like i'm left out i'm wondering like how many white people you know you were left out of the scholarship because you don't have any other scholarships like what so it seems to me that what you're doing is m making modern elder academy you're you're strengthening the yeah. academy you're strengthening you and you're strengthening everybody that's in so here's a question i would love to hear from each of you like you know, personally, what has been your experience and what does it mean to you? Because I understand what you're saying, like, in the big picture. But, you know, I, I'd like to hear your personal experiences because, hey, I want to go to Modern Elder Academy for anything. So, because I'm a modern elder. Anyway, so could you just start share some of your personal, what it means to you personally as a Black person? Who wants yeah. to go first? Wanda? Cassius? So for me, I mean... It was a transformational period in which I was really looking to understand my ancestry. I went to um, return to Ghana where I tracked a, a large portion of my DNA and really went there doing some soul searching about you know, the, the experience of George Floyd and race relations in America and trying to grapple with really the kind of transgenerational trauma that really had made me persist through things, although I was not liking them made me like in the context of my professional career where I had a great deal of success, like navigate spaces and places very successful in which I was deeply uncomfortable. And like the, 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 the toll that takes on you at that point in your life, it was just a good space after returning from Ghana and we're in Ghana. What was a really powerful moment for me was I was um, at the slave river where our ancestors were given what's called the last bath uh, before they were taken to one of the slave castles in Elmina or Cape Coast. And so there, while you're there, you have the opportunity to wade in the water. Two rivers kind of emerge and then to an eddy. And you walk in that water. And when I was in that water, it just it was a very transformational moment. It was a precursor to MEA. It was I was looking for like, like suffering in life. And I heard from like this message deeply while I'm walking in that word, like stop suffering. Like there's been a lot of suffering already. And that in fact, my return to that river is a miracle. Mm -hmm. It was a miracle that that DNA had returned to that spot. 
and that they had suffered enough. And so out of that moment, I started trying to define and sort out how to kind of re, re like a phoenix, reemerge from some stuff that was going on in my life with a new framework and mindset. So when I heard, I came back from, from um, Ghana, I, my friend recommended Black Modern and Elder Academy. And to me, it was irrelevant that it was Chip and he's a white guy. And it was like, there's enough, there's abundance in the world, enough work to be done. And there ought to be not subscribed to these false constructs and these false decisions about places and spaces and stuff and just create them in ways that people feel that they can do the work, period. Move on. And so Black, Auto, Black Modern Elder Academy was that these brilliant sisters conceived this with Chip to create a space where, and when I, I was a member of the first cohort, where I could go and do that work. I was searching for a place in this world that you can actually do that. And it wasn't any place for white folks or black folks. And so we were at, we're actually in a place in this space where Chip is recognized so that we actually need more of this. We need more spaces of this. You, they've got the new campus in Santa Fe, but also I, we can do this in our homes and our communities at our breakfast tables and at our dinner tables and help folks create safe spaces for people to be vulnerable enough to do the sorting that we talked about in that Christmas. Because you can do it over this weekend, but you can, after you leave that weekend, you got to keep on doing the work. You got to kind of commit to those routines and mindset shifts and, and do use the tools and strategies that you learn and start to surface at the Modern Elder Academy to actually make those shifts, to be, emerge from that crystal as like a, a butterfly. And so, I don't know, I'm, I'm named after Muhammad Ali, so floating like a butterfly and stinging like a bee really, really resonates with me. Wow, thank, thank you. I, you know, when, when you're talking, it just really makes me think about, again, because I, I do a lot of facilitation in organizations and organizations of, of every kind, that some of the keys is how do you make people feel safe? So how do you make people feel safe in the organization, but how do they feel safe inside themselves, you know, and with, and with other people. And I think that's what, I mean, I'll tell you, I've been doing DEI for a long time. I think that's one of the, an issue that I have is that some of the way people facilitate does not make everybody feel safe, no matter who it is. And so what I'm hearing you say <laughs> is that modern elder Academy is really like the model for making people feel safe. Because you could okay. all be bl Black people, but maybe you might not still feel safe. Go ahead. Diane, you go right ahead. I all know right, you so want to I'm going to say, I'm going to say, safety is a place of privilege. All right? It is not like this constant thing about safety and comfort. So we understand that there is psycho, there is actually physical safety and psychological safety. Physical safety, yeah. I think that safety is actually a construct that that white people use to what they're taught what they're really talking about is comfort their ability mm. like when they talk about well i don't feel safe that oh, yeah. often is code language for i feel uncomfortable in how what we are talking about how we are talking about something what and so i and and um uh uh oh i see your face right in front of me um uh, and I'll remember her name in, in two seconds, but there's this concept of uh, not safe spaces, but courageous spaces, right? That, 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 that the idea is that we, that when we are learning, when we are growing, when we are, when we, when we are transforming, that there needs to be courage and courage comes from the, the, the root road of heart, Right. So that the, that the spaces are, that we have courageous spaces that allow us to do the, the essential, critical, and challenging work that gets us through that tight space to change, right? Because, and that's why my, my was like, my face was contorting because for so, uh, so you know, decades and decades of, of, of work where, fo where folks, you know, the ability, like, so I, all the time when we talk about, so if we use the metaphor, we're having a banquet, right? We are building this amazing, fantastic, diverse, inclusive banquet, right? And then, and we're having planning meetings and someone says, this is actually not, you know, says, well, let's, let's, let's have our planning meetings in the, in, in, in city hall across the street from the police station, right? 
And it's like, but for some people, like coming into the center of town across the street from the police station doesn't necessarily feel safe. Yeah. So it it so much has to do with the pers- the with the 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 perspective that we carry that's associated with who, whose narrative, whose perspective, who whose story are we paying attention to? Because we could this is there's probably there's a whole other any number of podcasts that we can have subsequent to this about which stories are being told and being listened to around safety around the dominant culture around who who gets to decide what culture looks like well you know what when i was thinking about safety actually um i think i i was thinking about it in a different way i was thinking about how you know and, and i know that you've seen this too in organizations you'll have a leader who say the leader is white whatever you know white well usually like white and you know, just to be real and and they'll go, okay, everybody, we want to have inclusion. We're going to have a discussion right now, blah, 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 blah. And then you have like a black person, a black, I'll say, because I've seen this happen actually. So a black woman who will speak up. And then that person, A, gets shut down, doesn't get the promotion, might even lose their job. And that, that's what I was talking about that, you know, what does that say? Because to me, that's what I think about when, when I think about safety, I'm not, you know, I know other people think about other things, but, um, but but I think about that. Like, if you really support diversity, if you really support inclusion, then if people can't speak, then they're not safe. You're going to fire somebody because they're going to talk about maybe something being racist or, no, I don't want to come and, and eat a Jello mold or whatever, you know, <laughs> throw out a Jello mold. But then that's that's not inclusion. And it seems to me... That so you're I'm, strengthening yourself, that the Black Elder, Elder Academy seems to be a way of getting stronger. Right. Wanda, do you want to? Yeah, you, know, you know, it's interesting because you can not feel safe in a Black environment if you're Black too. Yeah. So for me, the Martin Elder Academy, what has been created there is not just a physical uh, environment that is conducive for one relaxing, but the curriculum that is put together also includes things like having a shaman who is, um, actually he's from Santeria. Uh, He studied that in Cuba. Mm -hmm. So you have that at your access along with swimming pools, saunas. Uh, You have the opportunity to get a massage if you so choose to. Um, So that type of environment right there alone. So you have the physical. Then you have people who who are coming to the academy that they're already at a stage of wanting to make a transition. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, as we grow older, everything changes. Now our body changes. We start looking different. We're not as pretty as we used to be. Oh, now we're still pretty. We're just differently pretty. I'm I'm just saying, you know, because (laughs) then we then then we then the wrinkles start coming, you know. So we start changing and aging, and some of us don't know how to cope with it, but we also know that we're getting closer to ending our lives. So it it, it comes to what kind of legacy do I want to leave behind? But the greatest thing I experience about the Black Martin Elder Academy Week is the ability to really be naked and tell my truth in a way that I know that I was going to be held because people had similar stories as as myself. So they were able to honor me in a way that I was not maybe not being honored elsewhere. But that's the difference. Right, you were being held, and you had this sense of really belonging, like holding in the cradle or being held in the womb of a mother's stomach. So, what did that holding feel like? It felt like um, being able to go down to our African roots and do rituals with drums and beats. It felt like um, gospel hymns that everybody knew that we had felt in our in our in our stories, our lived experience, some sense of caretaking and vulnerability that we were able to have in the midst of him singing those songs. It felt like dancing and poetry 
and felt like making art. It felt like walking with people and individuals who quickly became like brothers and sisters and family. And I think to answer your question, Sima, Sima in your example about the organization, like it matters the conditions in which people are able and being held. The, the individual was not held in a way that was, in, in this instance, you have to do that. And that requires folks, probably that individual, the leader needs the, something, something like a modern elder comes uh, to, to, to do the, the mindset disposition. But for her, as a Black woman, she needs a space like the Modern Elder Academy to come and be held because she's experienced something like that, because we have all have, and how we need to kind of process that and make sense of that experience as we chart the next phase of our lives. So that's it's a both-and situation, and we, we continue, yeah, come back to that. Let's interrogate and ask both of them with integrity. And I think Cassius, one of the things I think is really important to emphasize is that at Black MEA, we do not assume that there is a kind of that there is a generic or that there is a um, a particular mono culture around blackness, right? Mm -hmm. That I think that one of the most powerful pieces, one of the most powerful powerful components around Black MEA it, and people it, people in the first cohort spoke to this is that there is such a, a that the that the academy provides um, a foundation for people to share the broad array of their experiences as Black people living on this planet, right? And that that um, that people spoke of the relief of being able to show up in their full selves with a variety of experiences, in contrast to being looked down upon or judged or assumptions being made by what someone looked like, by what their work experience was, by what their family experience was. And I think that that is something that is um, so powerful about the, the, the container that we build um, at MEA, right? And I, and I think one of the, also one of the things that made our, and for me, when I think about my personal experience in going to an MEA, um, and then um, being on being one of the sisters where we helped design the curriculum and the full range of experiences that people experienced for um, five days, um, or actually seven days in, in the case of the first cohort, is that there was um, the ability, to, the, the, the feeling of being in community, like the, 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 the felt sense of being listened to, of, of, of seeing, who uh, seeing reflections of who I am in other people that were sitting around the circle, as well as seeing how people were different, and and the, the the that sense of pride and joy and love that occurred by my my telling my story and my hearing other people's stories. So I was bonded with the twenty one people in a way, and that I will be bonded with with everyone that was in co in the cohort for the rest of my life right and that's extraordinary and i and i've been in communities for for a long time so to to find a space that is strong enough to hold the the array of of folks and i and i also think that um black mea is is most impactful when we when are the participants and the attendees are leaders in their own right, where there's a particular level of, I would say, um, a particular level of accomplishment and and uh, vision for Sorry. what their life has been and also what their life is going is going forward. Okay? You kind of know when you need it, and you know, you know, you know, you know, yeah. so you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, feel, I feel myself that there's like a, a re-commitment um, to your purpose mm -hmm. right? and somehow it, it it ignites our ability to make a difference in our community. Mm -hmm. So that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's what I feel happens there. Right. We and however we define community, right? However we can find community. Mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. uh, Sima, you mentioned earlier about, um, how there's only about, let's say 85% of white people do not have a social- No, friend. Um, friend, a black friend. Yeah. But socially, they may 
you know, uh, know somebody that, or they may go out to dinner or lunch or something like that because of work. That's, that's a big difference. And so when you don't have a friend, a black friend that you can connect with on a heart to heart basis, how difficult is it for you to be in a room with a black person and feel, um, you know, like an, an inclusive, non-inclusive rather. So that's, that's the so challenge. This is the interesting thing. This is the interesting thing though, Wanda. I think one of the things that makes black MEA so powerful is that so, I almost want to say everybody in the first cohort, we had been, we have been that sole friend, that in that one friend to thir- like I said earlier, 35 or 50 white people, right? And and the amount of holding. Right, or right, code switching or having to um, you know, that there is um there is a there is a difference culturally, right? And so the ability for 20, you know, 22, 25 black men and and women and and you know um humans right um being able to sit in circle together and to share stories around their um share stories around their lives about what has shaped them what has shaped their vision about what they want their life to be in the future and being then be given what i would say like little conceptual hooks you know, that allows us to place, oh, that's why that might be happening. Or, oh, I'd never thought about my life that way. You're like, oh, this is like an opportunity, right? And, but to do that in a space that, um, where there is profound listening and, 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 and growth that then allows us to, be, I, I say, be on purpose on purpose. Yeah, so a big part of what happens in that chrysalis, mm-hmm. right, is healing. Yes. Healing is the word that is, that's permitted. And so just just from all those lived experience, some of them traumatic. We had folks in our cohort that had had traumatic experiences with law enforcement, with racism, with um, sexism, homophobia, and like, like to just have a space to start a process of healing, like, like stage one of trauma, like doing this recognition stuff. And but you need a space and place where you can do that separate from the routines of family and other commitments and maybe sort all that stuff out. So that healing space is important in midlife. And a lot of what happens in that chrysalis, remember that metaphor is like some of that DNA that the butterfly that the caterpillar takes into the, the metaphor is retained. But a lot of it is a metamorphosis. And so really that metamorphosis, there's some healing that happens in that. There's some the word I would use, some grace making that you have to do in life, right? Given grace to around stuff that happened in your past and your attribution and contribution to that. And by giving that grace, you're able to arrive at a different self level of self-love, of self-care, and the disciplines and, and, and commit yourself to the disciplines and routines required to sustain all that stuff. And so, you know, that's what's so sacred about the Modern Elder Academy is because it's a space for that. And I would just establish that as a matter of like abundance, there is a lot of pl- more spaces like this needed. Modern Elder Academy has created a space one week that probably have stuff at Santa Fe, but I just think about like the other people and spaces where we can just invite others to this process of becoming a modern elder because elder is not something new in our community. We've talked about it before and it's not about like your age or how many hip replacements you've had and stuff like that. It has to do about your lived experiences and, and your ability to give wisdom to those around you, to be as the modern elder curriculum talks about a mentor to folks to start as Wanda talked about to build a legacy which is fundamental to our culture, legacy is like, and legacy make, making is about what it means to be black and, 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 and uh, 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 descendants of the diaspora. It's about legacy. It, Cassius, and in, 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 in listening to you, one of the things I think is so important for people to understand, and, and Seema, I can imagine that this topic comes up frequently in your podcast about, or might, 
around racial identity, right? And how yeah. do we, identity in general and race, racial identity specifically. And one of the powerful things about Black MEA is that we do not make assumptions about what your journey has been around your identity, race, gender, or whatever. And I think this is really, really important because I think there have been any number that, that there are there are times and spaces where there is an assumption about you must have this particular frame about how you see yourself. Like if you go to women's retreats or if you go, you know, if, mm -hmm. like when you think about the array of the personal transformation and the human development movements, you know, there are any number of models where there is an assumption about, oh, well, what is it that got got you to this particular place. And one of the powerful things I, I think about Black MEA is that we do not make an assumption about how you identify yourself, how you got there, what your racial, like, or even, how we even define Black, right? I'm how okay. we define African, you know? And I think that, and that's one of the, that was one of the superpowers, that is one of the superpowers around Black MEA is that we don't, so people, you get to come as you are, right? I think that's in general, what MEA does, but especially within the Black MEA, right? And I think that that is a really important um, point to drive home, and this is what makes it so special. And we're really hoping that people in hearing about this um, really go to um, the MEA website and and look for the, the workshop that's happening in Baja in jo July. Yeah. Um, uh, in and look under workshops and it's telling our telling our story telling our stories so it's in june folks look it's in oh, june. june sorry yeah sorry june, right june um so and because it's, it's actually it's a little bit challenging when you go to the website to find it so it is a a, a workshop in june in baja and if you if you type telling our stories the link should come up that gives you a description and that um and that leads you to the application right we're gonna put all, and we're gonna put all this in in the show notes. And actually, you just, I'll tell you after this. You just gave me another idea for a show mm -hmm. that I really that I, I want to have. Um, so, and I'll talk, talk to you, tell you about it afterwards because maybe you want to be, you know, do it with me. So, I'm looking at the time, and I know we got to stop. But is there anything else? I mean, there's so much because, I, you know, I'm just really learning so much and getting so much out of this. So. Anything else? Just Any go to www.meawisdom.com. And as Diane said, look for telling our stories, celebrating our spirits, vision, our future. And it's um, going to be time. It's June the 10th through the 15th. And again, in Baja, Mexico. So I, I, I actually, there is one other thing. Because I think, I think that there are, I don't know. I, I think that there are very few quote unquote accidents right, in our lives. And I also think that each individual person carries a wisdom that is not just in their intellect, but they have wisdom in their head, their head, heart, and their body, right? And so in listening, if you're listening to this broadcast and there's like where your body starts getting, what is it, Jennifer Lopez says, I got the goosies, right? I love it, right? That, that, that if, if, there, if your body is like, wow, or it's like that the, the hairs on the back of your neck start kind of, or you feel prickly or you, or something happens in your body. I think that means you either know somebody that you have to tell them about this. You know, you have to, you have to, not only do you have to tell somebody about it, but you have to make sure that they come. Right. And that person might be you. Right. But, uh -huh. the, and that to really, because the, I think the other thing that's really, when we think, when I think about my own um, most profound, impactful, personal transformation experiences and even lived experience in my life. It's because I followed my intuition. It's because I didn't, I didn't pay attention only to what was happening intellectually, but I paid attention to what, um, yeah, literally what my body was telling me to do. That is living in New York city and walking home one night. It saved my life. I'm sure. You know, I was like, Diane, don't be paranoid. I was like, no, you are going to, you are, you are going to leave Grand Army Plaza, that subway, and you are going to walk into the first doorman building that you see because there is something, you know, so it, it literally like we have to pay attention to that intellect that is beyond just what's between our two ears. Thank yeah. you so much. 
Uh, but you just brought it back because I remember I'm from New York and you'd be walking out at night and you go, okay, where's the doorman building? Because in those days you could feel safe in doorman building. I don't yes. know now they've just killed the doorman too. So I don't know, <laughs> but you know, I, you know, I just really want to thank, thank you all so much for being on the show. And we actually do need to do another show mm -hmm. yes. or two or three several. or four. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> several. I'm, I'm definitely, I'm definitely down for that. So, you're going to give me all your like your show um like your socials and it's gonna be up on the website everybody so i'm going to close it'll take a sec and then would you just hang on for a sec mm -hmm. okay so hey everybody this is sima the inclusionist we just had an amazing show talking about the black modern elder academy with cassius johnson diane johnson and wanda whitaker and we'll have all the information on the website as a Sima the Inclusionist, if you like what you heard today, and I know you did, please go to raceconvo.com, download more episodes, and please share this episode with at least one or two other people. If you'd like to help support our podcast, help us continue making these amazing shows, go to raceconvo.com, make a tax deductible, we are a nonprofit, make a tax deductible donation. If you'd like to have more of me, hit me up, Sima at SimaLieberman.com. I'm on LinkedIn and all the other socials. If you would like to have me come in and facilitate a program, uh, help you create a more inclusive work culture, or speak at one of your meetings, then hit me up. Or if you have ideas for the show, hit me up. Or maybe you want to be a guest. I don't know. Anyway, this is Sima, the Inclusionist, signing off. Until next time. I just want to share a podcast with you that I've started listening to. I've been listening to a lot of new podcasts. It's called Fire Breathing Kittens. It's an actual podcast about various tabletop role-playing games. You know, think like Dungeons and Dragons. It has a, a season-long plot, but there's a beginning and an end to each week's story, and you can start at any episode, which is what I've done. Every week has a different combination of four people from the same cast group of people. Uh, you you can join Fire Breathing Kittens if you like to solve mysteries. You can help them solve detective mysteries. And if you like to laugh, I think you might enjoy this podcast, Fire Breathing Kittens. <laughs>